Hello and welcome to the third of our Good Relations Lectures. There is a series of these, so you can find the first two on our website wrda.net and the fourth one will be coming shortly. This lecture is focused on the role of women in peace building in Northern Ireland. Uh, specifically, we're looking on the role of women in the past um, and we'll look more towards the role, the ongoing role and the role in the future in our fourth and final lecture. So in the last lecture, we talked a little about 1325 and you can watch that if you wish, uh, but without knowing that, um, you should know that it is a, a UN resolution focused on the role of women in peace building worldwide. And although it doesn't apply here, it's not recognized here, women are still involved in really important peace building work and they always have been. It is not new, it's not because of 1325, it's really an ongoing thing from the very early days of the conflict here. Um, movements for peace began early in the conflict here and peace building work has been constant ever since. It's not always visible, it's not always considered newsworthy, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening in multifarious different ways in communities across Northern Ireland. Most of these peace movements in the past have been organized or run by women. And a trend in history, not just history locally, but history worldwide, is that these women are rarely recognized or celebrated, either in their own time or after the fact. And because they're not recorded in the way uh, and with the same level of seriousness that some senior male politicians are recognized and recorded, these things get lost. And if they aren't um, documented carefully, and if the lessons learned from those times aren't passed on through the generations, then they get lost completely to time. Um, and we need to focus on these things more when we are explaining and teaching about what happened here. And as we do the work going forward, which will be the subject of our next lecture. It's important that we change this, not just because these women deserve recognition, and not just because the work that they did deserves recognition, but also because, as we know, peace isn't a done deal. It isn't something that you sign a piece of paper and you're done with. It's something you have to keep working at and building generation upon generation. And it can take multiple generations for these lessons to really be fully absorbed and embedded. And for that reason, it does a practical reason as well as a duty to these women to record what they have done and uh, they input that they, put, that they gave to our whole society. So women were a significant driving force in the civil rights movement. This precedes the, the conflict itself, at least in any official capacity. They were involved in organizations like the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association or NICRA and the Homeless Citizens League that was a precursor, precursor to that. Um, it focused on the rights of families to have a home um, and a roof over their heads. And uh, it was because of those protests that the civil rights movement really got started. And although this isn't the time to go into that in great detail, uh, that was focused entirely on families and their rights to a home. And overwhelmingly, the activists who were doing things like occupying empty homes were women with small children, um, th those most in need of a home. Um, it wasn't so much born out of idealism as it was born out of necessity, and the idealism was attached. There were prominent women like Bernadette Devlin, later Bernadette McCallisky, and Inez McCormick, and they worked in different ways and in different fields on social justice issues. Um, and they became widely recognized around the world and, and celebrated and, uh, you know, uh, rewarded for that. And, and that's fantastic. But they became uh, almost like figureheads for the women who were doing the work who weren't being recognized and um, whose work isn't recorded in the same way. Um, and it's important, like I say, that we recognize those women now. Um, when the troubles began officially, once again, the social justice issues that women like Bernadette Devlin and like the Homeless Citizens League had been highlighting before the violence began were put on the back burner. This happened uh, across the board. It happened, you know, from, from the British government. It happened from the Stormont uh, 
government at the time. It happened from both communities and their leadership who were more or less told, telling the women, we appreciate that these are issues. We appreciate that you're, um, you know, activist around these issues. But ultimately, they aren't as important as what's happening right now. And so they were put on the back burner and in some cases put on the back burner for decades before they were really looked at or taken seriously again. And uh, women, as a result, women like Bernadette Devlin and Inez McCormick seemed exceptional rather than exemplars of what was going on already. Um, it seemed to on the surface like most women were happy to go along with the narrative that women aren't really um, involved in social justice issues uh, and are rather busy, uh, you know, at home or at work and so on. Um, it wasn't really true. While formal politics was completely dominated by men, that is to say, when you look at the, a history book that shows you the prominent figures in politics here from the 60s, 70s onwards, you will see a lot of men. And that's true, there were plenty of men there, but there were women involved in peace building efforts from the beginning in communities who never made it into the history books. Some examples of these, uh, and these are all historical examples, um, and some of these are widely known and some of these are much less widely known. Women Together was a group of women formed in October 1970, so early in the days of the conflict, and it was a cross-community uh, group that was designed to take a stand against both violence but also sectarianism as a whole. It was formed by two women, uh, um, Ruth Agnew, who was a Protestant working class woman from the Gasworks area of Belfast, and Monica Patterson, who was a Catholic woman, originally from England, but had been living in South Belfast for a number of years at that stage. They advertised publicly um, that they wanted to form this group and they invited people to a public meeting and hundreds of people attended that first meeting and signed up. As time went on, they started to form satellite groups across Northern Ireland. The first group was based in Belfast. But over time, they became more and more um, prominent, I suppose, in communities all across Northern Ireland, urban and rural. The aim was protecting homes, families and communities. So it didn't have an explicit aim in terms of a political outcome regarding the constitutional question here. In fact, it deliberately was um, leaving that question off the table. Individual members had their own views one way or the other, um, but uh, they wanted to focus on mitigating the impact of what was going on in the conflict on ordinary people. So some of their work included, there was more to it than this, but this is uh, the highlights, if you will. Uh, campaigning for support for victims of violence. And, you know, we know still uh, 2021, we don't necessarily have all the support for the survivors of the conflict that we should have. Campaigning for integrated schools, which they believed would mitigate the problems into the future. Um, and this was at that stage, integrated schooling wasn't really the done thing at all. It still isn't as widespread as it could be based on demand. They organized trips into the countryside for children from areas particularly badly hit by violence. And this was really to give them, I suppose, a window, a window into a normality. It was the little thing that they could do. Uh, when I say they organized trips, sometimes they would be housed at the homes of uh, members of, of women together. Sometimes uh, when they would be sent to, you know, a, a campsite or something, the women would have reached into their own pockets to put the money together to enable this to happen. They also did really practical on the ground work like forming human chains in the street when young people were throwing stones. So sometimes this would escalate into a full scale riot or more um, other kinds of violence and forming humans chains uh, would stop people from throwing stones because no matter what side of the community you were on, there was somebody in that human chain who you knew and cared about and didn't want to be subject to violence. And that was a really um, brave, but also very important and unrecognized piece of work that those women did. A lot of it was done in secret. And this is partially because the women feared uh, repercussions from paramilitaries one side or the other in their own community. And that in itself is, uh, you know, obviously a brave and a dangerous thing but it's also something that shows the level of commitment that these women had to the work that they were doing. 
sometimes they would also visit the homes of somebody who had died um, as a result of the conflict. And when they did that, they always made a point to send one person from each of the two traditional communities in order to send a message that they didn't stand for sectarian violence um, wherever it was coming from. Another example of a peace movement was Peace People, which was formed by two women in 1976. It was formed out of a tragedy. Um, it was both experienced and witnessed by the two founders. Uh, there was a Catholic woman called Mairead Corrigan uh, who lost her sister and nephews and nieces in an uh, accident. And there was a Protestant woman called Betty Williams who had witnessed the incident. And um, while the accident you know was an accident it had been connected with the conflict here uh, soon they were joined by a journalist called kieran mckeown and the three of them formed the leadership of peace people but again they opened it out to membership from everybody and anybody who wanted to join and they had huge numbers thousands of people signed their um calling for uh the, an end to the conflict here now, there were those who had issues with that, and, and I, I don't want to make it look as though uh, it was always plain sailing, because it really wasn't. Um, there were people who felt that by simply calling for an end to violence, uh, you're not looking at the underlying issues that caused the conflict in the first place, and you won't actually help anything. Um, that could be uh, a legitimate viewpoint, but uh, what they were calling for went beyond simply an end to violence in after a short period of time. Um, the declaration that they wrote, calling for peace, rejecting violence as a means to force change, um, had huge numbers of signatories and they held marches across Northern Ireland in various different towns and cities, also in the Republic of Ireland and England as solidarity marches. <clears throat> Um, over time and sort of cognizant of the criticism they were getting for taking a very black and white view that the only problem is violence and not the causes of that violence, they also started to campaign against some of the issues around that and that included against what was known as the Special Powers Act. That polarised opinion in some ways because some people thought it was overly sympathetic to uh, Republican causes. Mind you, it had been um, the subject of criticism from the civil rights movement um, from the beginning as well. It did um, cause some ructions and some people left the movement as a result, um, but also it gave voice to many people who agreed with their position and who weren't finding a way to voice that outside of um, Republican or nationalist parties. And uh, in doing that and in drawing attention to the issues that were going on here, uh, Williams and Corrigan won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1976. This is sometimes forgotten. Um, everybody remembers that uh, John Hume and David Trimble shared the Nobel Peace Prize uh, some decades later, but people forget about these women who also campaigned for peace and who won it um, first. Around the same time as that was going on, women's centres were being set up across Northern Ireland. It was really into the early 1980s before that began to happen. All of these women's centres were not gifts given to the women of the local communities by Stormont, Westminster or indeed anywhere else. They were all organised and set up by the women in the communities themselves, often on a shoestring budget and, you know, really taking, um, putting everything that they had and more into the setting up of the women's centres. Uh, once they were established, they began to apply for funding and often won that funding because of the work that they were doing. From the very beginning, they worked together across sectarian divides and they, they really wanted to focus on uh, anti-sectarian work and they did a great deal and continue to do a great deal of work in dismantling sectarian prejudices. This is not the same thing as telling people they cannot be unionist or they cannot be nationalist. It's much more subtle than that. It's that you can be unionist or nationalist, but sectarianism is a different thing. Um, it implies prejudice, belief about uh, one group or the other. And to do that, they would literally cross peace lines. Um, you know, the Shankill Women's Centre and Falls Women's Centre famously worked together uh, with young people, bringing them across 
the city, I mean, across the city sounds like it's a long distance. It's really not a long distance, but from one community to the other through the peace uh, gates, um, despite dangers to themselves, to get to know each other and to understand each other better. That was really the purpose of it. Uh, and they continue to do that work to this day. Um, these centers themselves also played a massive role within their own community. They allowed women, local women, to pursue practical educational opportunities. Um, for example, they would offer things like studying for GCSEs, um, learning basic computer skills, uh, English as a foreign language as time has gone on, various things like this. Um, they also helped with childcare, uh, which is really, really vital because that's one of the biggest barriers to women, particularly women in working class areas. Um, if they don't have childcare and they can't afford childcare, which I mean, it's extremely expensive, uh, their educational opportunities and career opportunities are often cut short. And by helping out with that and by um, providing subsidized childcare that was reliable and local and on the doorstep, it made, it just opened up the world to these women. Uh, the most, uh, it also gave the poorest, most marginalized and often traumatized women, traumatized by the violence that was going on around them, um, an outlet and a place where they could talk and be taken seriously and um, let their issues off their chest. And it really shouldn't be underestimated how important that was to those women and to the community as a whole in, in recovering from what went on here um, in so much as we have at all. The importance of that peace building work done in women's centers and by the women who used them, who continue to do the work to this day, cannot be overstated. Um, nobody wins awards for these things most of the time, but uh, that doesn't mean to say that it's not vital work. All of this is the tip of a really large iceberg. It cannot be stated uh, enough how big this iceberg is. Um, there are names that I don't know and that will never be recorded in history books who did absolutely vital work in making peace work here and continue to do that work. Um, and I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, it's often the work of the people whose names don't get recorded in history books that we need to um, recognize the most. When the Women's Coalition formed in April of 1996 to contest elections um, to the forum that preceded the talks for the Good Friday Agreement and then the, the setting up of a new um, system, uh, people were surprised by the formation of a women's coalition. I can only assume that those people hadn't been paying attention to what had been going on and the work that women had been doing. Um, the, they were either not paying attention or they were deliberately minimizing the issues that the women's coalition were talking about. The women's coalition was cross community as well. They always had two leaders and those two leaders were drawn from each side of the community. Um, they were sometimes also criticized for taking a relatively um, neutral view on the constitutional question. But while they did as a whole, individual members had their personal views. And over time, it took them a little while to find their feet and find their confidence in doing this. But over time, they started to address issues that were perceived to be either Republican or unionist issues such as, for example, the treatment of women in Ar Arma jail. Um, and they started to take those issues on and deal with them as human rights issues uh, rather than simply as uh, Republican issues, the way they had often been treated. Um, but also the Women's Coalition's focus was on what they called the bread and butter issues, the everyday issues like, how am I going to pay for childcare? How am I going to make sure that my child gets a good education and so on? Those kinds of issues were minimized to such a degree that we all uh, perhaps have heard of the way in which the members of the Women Coalition who were elected to the forum discussions were um, mocked and abused and had all sorts of um, sexist nonsense shouted at them from prominent politicians um, who went on to have uh, wonderful, successful careers. Um, these established politicians reacted in such a way that it really demonstrated in itself the need for the presence of these women. Um, 
also the importance of hearing an all too often sidelined perspective, which was the voices of women who perhaps didn't come from any um, established political party, but who were reflecting the views of the women who they represented. And while all of this was happening in the foreground, so to speak, women were working hard at peace building in the backgrounds. Um, we talked already about the role of women's centres. Um, it cannot be stressed enough how much these women were these women's centres were working with each other. Um, most notably, Shankill Women's Centre and Falls Women's Centre, as I've already mentioned, um, the way that they approached these issues at the height of the conflict set the bar for respectful inter-community relations. Uh, sometimes at the time, particularly less so now that we have the Community Relations Council and we have huge amounts of good relations work going on. We understand that you can respect both views and both perspectives, but still seek to build peace between them. At the time, it was not necessarily understood that way. It was a very black and white uh, case of you do, do not talk to those people. In, in a lot of these communities. And a lot of these centers were set up in the communities most pr badly affected by the violence. So it was a place where these kinds of, um, this kind of dialogue was needed most. And um, there were countless women, like I've said, working in communities all across Northern Ireland um, to achieve the same ends with similar means, which is to say, the approach of uh, dialogue and conversation and respectful understanding and sometimes the need to put aside personal views about the constitutional question and work on issues from a human rights perspective, even if they affect people who do not agree, primarily affect people who do not agree with your political position. And those lessons were vital. And we're going to explore more in detail the lessons that these approaches have taught us and that we need to continue to carry on in our future work. And next time, we're going to look more at the ongoing work um, that women's good relations work is doing and what we need for the future. And um, of course, some of the latter part will be a bit speculative. What do we need to learn from the past and what, how should we approach good relations work for women in the future? So we'll leave it there. If there are any questions on this or indeed any of the past good relations workshops, online, please do put them in the comments and we will answer them in the last lecture. We'll also be uploading uh, our Good Relations Week event from last September of 2020 um, shortly as well. So you can watch that too. Thank you so much for your time.